This, I have to say, we're next door is a very interesting class on storytelling. So if any of you are supposed to be in, in that class, uh, this is, it would be a good time. I, I'm not going to be doing storytelling, uh, just to be clear on this. This is the Cass Business School, for those of you who have not been there uh, before, which is down by Moorgate, and I was very heavily involved in the design of that building. And in the design of that building, a lot of our thinking about these three areas, virtual, physical, and imaginative spaces, took place. Now, Neil's already mentioned the uh, Michael degree, and I'm very pleased to say that in this room now we've got a number of our current students and some of our very eminent alumni from that degree. So uh, we're very, very pleased about that. And of course that embodies the very spirit of creativity. 2013, look, I've put this in gold. It's not Olympic year, I know, but it's a gold because it's the 10th anniversary of the Cass Learning Laboratory, which I'm the director of. And this laboratory has had a focus, as you can see, from what we've done here on spaces, physical, virtual, and imaginative. And uh, for those of you academics, I've, I've used a star system to show how much money we've, been, we've had involved with this, not necessarily all our own uh, money. In some cases, we've been very good at spending other people's money. But uh, essentially, we've been funded through a, a series of projects from UK government, um, the European Union, and from the university itself. And we have consistently been implementing and researching physical, virtual, and imaginative spaces. And you can see right at the top, Bunhill, that's our building, that was a major stimulus. And we were working for over five years on the design of that building before that. So um, in case you think we've only been in this business for 10 years, before that, uh, we had a 15-year period where we were primarily working on virtual spaces, but towards, uh, as we got nearer to our new building, we built up a lot of expertise in physical space and we did a big project for the Design Council and also a major consultancy piece of work for the BBC. So we've had a lot of experience and I shall be coming back to some of these uh, cells in the spreadsheet later. Now my own research as Professor of Information Management when I came to the university uh, has been in collaborative decision making. Uh, and that's broadened into work and learning. So I'm very interested historically in the use of technology to help groups, teams and organizations work more effectively together. And I'm going to pick on various people in the audience just to add a bit of insecurity to uh, proceedings. And one of the uh, important people in this is Andy Wilkins who's sitting in the front row. You may or may not wish to identify yourself, Andy. <laughs> Doesn't look like he wants to... Uh, identify himself, but uh, I, uh, when I was sponsored by uh, Bull Information Systems, Andy was the marketing director of Bull, and he introduced me to the theories of creativity. And we are talking about more than two years ago. We're more like add a zero to that is how long uh, we've been collaborating on this. Um, so I was already familiar with that. I uh, looked at how technologies were used for supporting people working in groups, various methods. That led on to an interest in knowledge, in innovation and in design. So that sets the academic scene. Clearly this evening I haven't got time to go through all the references. Um, so I apologise for that for those of you who want to make a note of a lot of the references. But this shows you the breadth. Essentially what I've done is drawn a broad range of different uh, academic areas. And this is the thing that Andy introduced me to. I don't know, Andy, whether 20 years ago it was exactly that diagram, but it was, it was pretty similar. It comes from Rhodes' 1960s work, the four Ps framework, uh, the four factors that impact on creativity, product, process, person, and place for our, our purposes today. And place, very importantly, includes this concept here of climate. Now, over the last, um, really since the Cox report in 2006, we've seen a huge increase in interest in design. And needless to say, the Danes were there earlier. In 2003, they did this study, very interesting uh, study, which tried to show that design impacted on profitability. So if you look at these step one organizations, these were classified by the Danish researchers as not using design, which is a kind of conscious process. 
In step two, they were just using design in a superficial way, styling. Step three, they were using it as a process. And number, step four, as innovation. And surprise, surprise, if you look at the increase in their sales, their increase in employment and so on, it's all correlated with which stage they were in the use of design. So the essential message coming through from uh, this Danish research was the more you use design concepts, the more profitable you are going to be. Um, and so if we just extend that to from design to space, which is what I'm talking about, but the two overlap quite significantly, um, we've got two possibilities. One is that the thing in that left-hand column causes the thing in the right-hand column. Uh, and if we look specifically at space, uh, does the space lead to more creativity? The other possibility is the other way around. Does more creativity lead to um, the space? And which do you think in the general media of those two options, if we talk about space now, does space lead to creativity or does creativity lead to interesting spaces? From those of you who read just everyday newspapers, which do you think gets the, the, the vote of the journalists and media? Yeah, probably, probably, well, <laughs> yeah. say that there's, there's an impression that uh, creatives command greater salaries and more resource so they get better, beautiful spaces. That's so that's the, that that you're going that way around. Yeah, so that's an. I don't agree with it. Yeah, okay. I would say the opposite, actually. Um, okay. Okay, well, we'll take a vote on that. I said we'd be interactive today. So how many uh, people will take this? The, the first one will be yours. I don't know your name, but uh, this is yours. How many are going to vote for that as there? You can only have one vote, although I can't audit it. Uh, how many are going to vote for this one? That it's being creative leads to the uh, it, it design space. So that's about... Uh, Andy, you can help me in this. Uh, 10, 15. And how many are voting for... The other one, so we've got a big majority for the other one. And I would have said in the media, it's the second one. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. Um, in fact, my view is the second one. I, I am skeptical about the idea that physical space improves creativity. I think it's much more likely that organizations which are already creative will invest in more interesting and stimulating spaces. I do not actually believe it's the space that causes the creativity. I think, uh, and I, I think you can understand why a lot of people want to, to believe the middle one because it kind of shifts the responsibility. Uh, you could, you've got a kind of silver bullet that we invest in the space and then we'll have more creativity. Uh, actually, I believe, if we're going back to this model, <coughs> that the thing that really matters in organizational creativity and innovation is this factor in here. Does the organization create a climate where people in that organization feel able to be innovative and to be more individually creative? And if that is missing, you can invest as much as you want in the physical building, but you won't get anything from it. Now, uh, that's quite a controversial point of view, and although we're going to have Q&A later, Neil, I'm very happy to take any criticism of that particular point uh, now, because some people might not uh, agree with me, and I've been rather... Yes, please? I was thinking that maybe it's not uh, a correlation in one direction or the other direction, but yeah. there is a, a third... Uh, well, th well, that's what I'm arguing. I'm saying actually it's the climate, yeah. which is not either of those two things, okay. which makes the organisation more prone or able to innovate. So, it's yeah, I, that is what I... And, and how much is it the space between the buildings rather than the buildings? Well, I, I'm, I'm th I would include all the aspects. Uh, this um, research that we've looked at looks at everything, not, not just, if you like, offices or it looks at all aspects of the physical, the physical environment, as it were. Uh, and as I was uh, examining the, uh, this question of design, it struck me that there were really three broad approaches here. Now, these th design is a very broad term. We can use it for designing iPads. We can talk about designing computer systems. We can talk about designing buildings. So design is, is a very, very broad term. But it struck me that all these fields of design, there are three broad approaches. 
Now, the most long-standing, really, is the rational or instrumental. So somebody has a vision that they want a product. Maybe it's a bishop in Milan in the 14th century wants a cathedral. So they have this vision, they hire somebody to do it, and the cathedral gets built. So that's essentially a rational, instrumental approach, and it's very, very common. Now, after the Second World War, there was a lot of criticism of this purely rational approach. You have a goal, you seek alternative ways of doing it, and you meet it, to try and understand the factors that, that made these systems go wrong. That movement was called socio-technical systems thinking, and that brought really the human element into it. The idea that the humans involved this had their own motivations and needs, which had to be taken account of quite separately from the rational or instrumental aim. That has also been succeeded by a, a much more sceptical philosophy to design, which says that grand master plans often don't work, and that what we need to do is to have a very highly evolutionary approach. And of course we see that in modern uh, dot-com environments, where you do something, you fiddle around with it, and you keep developing it. Now that scientifically is called bricolage, a term originally invented in anthropology by Levi Strauss, taken up by uh, French philosophers later that decade. And my colleague now sadly passed away, Claudio Chibora from the LSE, Electric Information Systems. He made a lot of uh, argument for why you shouldn't invest all your money up front, but you should slowly release the money to allow systems to be adaptively implemented. And I'm going to come back to these because they are, to some extent, conflicting philosophies and um, they can't actually necessarily be readily reconciled together. But those are the three broad approaches. So a lot of the things, most of the things we see about us almost certainly coming from a rational, instrumental point of view. Um, Scandinavian uh, systems often put more emphasis on the socio-technical side and we see uh, all sorts of different places but especially in the dot-com area, uh, I'll emphasis on that bricolage aspect. So I'm going to start by looking at physical spaces. Bear in mind that I'm not going to claim that the physical spaces I show you do necessarily cause better creativity, but they might be examples where organizations with a good climate could exploit these uh, benefits. Now the first physical space I want to look at is a suitcase. And this suitcase is very important in my own journey here. I was in Toronto in 2005, and I saw this suitcase, which is a PhD thesis. This suitcase is from a PhD, Daria Loy, who you can see uh, there in the middle, who's Italian. She was a lecturer in the uh, Melbourne, and her PhD was the suitcase. A most incredible PhD actually happens to be about knowledge and space, and uh, she went to a lot of trouble to get permission to produce a PhD as a suitcase. It's a remarkable piece of work. Um, it probably took three times more effort than just doing it as a thesis, but she was insistent that there would, would be this. Now, this is her actually in an art gallery in uh, her home country of Italy, where she took it and exhibited it, and then the notebooks in there are what all uh, people, visitors, completed notebooks and symbolically put them into her suitcase. So when I, 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 I saw it in the external examiner's office in Toronto and I realized that um, knowledge does not all have to be conveyed in conventional ways. That was the big breakthrough for me personally in 2005. So when we talk about physical space, we're not even thinking about buildings. We, we're thinking about anything which can be in a physical form and help us to be more creative. So that was a fascinating insight. Daria now works at um, the Intel Labs in Beaverton, uh, Oregon, on user experience design. As Neil knows, she's come over and presented to us here at City uh, in the last few years. Uh, I'm delighted that at the back of the room who sneaked in is Raul Espejo, my very long-standing colleague, actually from the 1970s. So, so great to have you here. Raoul, and it was Raoul introduced me to the British management guru Stafford Beer, and Raoul who invited me to this event. I can't, uh, I don't know if you could uh, remember where that event was. So it was a nice hotel in the Cotswolds. 
And what Stafford Beer did, Stafford Beer was uh, an operational researcher. He's very mathematically skilled. He was an incredible user of computers. But he felt that we wasted too much time in meetings. Now, this will be of little interest to people in this room because I'm pretty sure all of you go only to highly efficient meetings. But for Stafford Beer, he'd spent his career in utterly inefficient and time-wasting meetings. He said there had to be a better way. And he came up with this method of enabling people in groups. Can you, can you summarize it in two sentences? Or are you going to make me do it? Okay. So it's a structured way of people in a physical place uh, combining and recombining to discuss ideas in what I call a semi-structured and uh, evolving way. Uh, basically, you're in continual conversations with different groups of people. The whole mathematic is all based around a mathematical theory of an icosahedron based on people's initial preferences which they've expressed. It's a fantastic experience. It's a one, you know, I've been to two or three of these now and Raoul and I did Back in the 90s, we did an electronic, partially electronic version from Cass Business School, and it's a fantastic me mechanism, but it's quite expensive to run. It time, takes time and effort, but um, we don't have to just have normal uh, in inefficient meetings. That's what it proved to me back in that wonderful hotel. In the, I can remember the hotel. I couldn't remember where it was, Raoul. And so conversation is something that we need to get into creativity, and that is one of the very tiny number of methods that I've, I've seen develop which can help us uh, on that. My own uh, work, the top right is Stafford Beer's uh, room. What, you, can you can probably tell it's from the 70s, this particular room. And in fact, it wasn't until Raoul and I um, collaborated with a Chilean artist in... Um, Karlsruhe, that I realized that the, if you look very carefully at the left hand, where the left hand goes, um, what, I, what you can't quite see in the photograph is that the left hand bit had two purposes. One was for a whiskey glass, and the silver thing is for a cigar, which tells you it was definitely the 70s. This was for the government of Chile to carry out its high-level planning. And what's the symbolism of the room being circular? Shared. The, the sharing. Demo it's much more democratic. And the walls were all using dis uh, displays. And this is in the pre-computer era, so there were slides. There was a liquid display, not a liquid crystal display, but a liquid display of the Chilean uh, economy up there on the left. And it was all controlled from those key sort of Nintendo-type keypads which controlled the slide projector by pressing combinations of buttons. And uh, what, what we did with the artist in uh, Karlsruhe was recreate this. He recreated one of the chairs and uh, exhibited it very, very impressively. This was in the presidential palace in... Um, yeah, the recreation. Yeah. It was not in the palace. Uh, but it was in the palace where Allende was, uh, died on the 11th of Se ironically, on the 11th of September, 72, 73. So that was uh, when I was, uh, that inspired me. And when I came to design my boardroom of the 21st century uh, at the West London um, Enterprise Centre, that was what I came up with. So I was in paying homage to beer there. There are laptops under, the, under each... Uh, See, like I, I very much liked the um, circular format of that. They had video conferencing, had triple uh, projectors on three of the walls and so on. Uh, I'm a bit obsessed with round tables. This is the Orange Imaginarium at uh, Baker Street. I think the building's been demolished now. But again, you can see very, the very great symbolism of a circular uh, space there. Uh, when we came to build the Cass Business School, I lost one major battle uh, which related to the library. And uh, I had argued we should have chaise long in the library. <laughs> and what, can you imagine what the librarians said? They actually said two things to me. Anyone going to guess what the librarians <laughs> said? The second thing they said was, as 
Mark says, everyone is going to fall asleep. <laughs> and the first thing was they gave me the number of the university doctor to check my mental condition. Now, subsequently, I, I've been in Stockholm where I've seen Shays Long in libraries. And in that library in Stockholm, KTH, uh, I saw plenty of students asleep at the regular desks. Students do not need Shays Long <laughs> to fall asleep in libraries. This is not a requirement. Now, why, uh, does anyone know why I was so obsessed with, with this Shays Long business? Yeah, would allow people to share. So I, I think it's a, I, I think it's a single user. Well, in normal, normal <laughs> academic situations, <laughs> it's a single user environment. It's the idea of kind of moving away from goal directed activity into something. It, it is partly that, but there's a more physiological yeah, reason. It, 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 it's about 12% of the population works at their best when they're lying down. It's not that we're all relaxed, it's that a minority of us are this. Now I'm going to put my hand up, I'm in this 12, is anyone else willing to admit they're in this so a below average number? So that means a few people not probably, so there's about four or five of us in the room admitting to being our best when totally horizontal. No, it's, a, it's a, like a personal pre style preference that we are possibly for physiological reasons, some of us in this room think better when we're like, no, not, not comatose. <laughs> now, there's another percentage of the population which are the other way around, and they're actually at their best when they're standing up. And I don't know if any of you have seen this particular, been to the same, seen this one? Uh, Yolanta, you've been? Or you know what, what it's... Yeah. Yo, you're in that falling out group. This is Chartwell. Somebody said Chartwell. So this is Churchill. And Churchill had actually had two standing up uh, setups. If you go to Chartwell, one was for reading and the other was for writing. So he did both his reading and writing, but at separate places. So anyone want to put their hand up for standing up? Oh, we've got a lot more standers in the... Oh, we're very strongly standing. That's above average for standing, so... Back problems, Clive. Back problems, okay. <laughs> yes, please? The, uh, the novelist Philip Roth writes standing up. Okay. So, it's interesting, isn't it? So, it, it's fascinating here. I mean, the underlying argument here for these two is about diversity. The, the fact is, often offices, libraries, all these things get, de get de designed around one mode or the other. And what what I argued when we built our new building was we want diversity. We want to c cater for different sorts of people. But that's not the way, unfortunately, some procurement. We have now got a sofa in the, in the cast library. What about kneelers? Kneelers. Kneelers. <laughs> well, we do a poll. Have we got any kneelers? No one admitting to, to kneeling. <laughs> well, there's chairs rather than there. You can get those. I've yeah. seen those. Uh, uh, well, I mean, yeah. Not, I don't mean sort of. Yeah. But they are kneeling. It is kneeling, yeah. Okay. So the argument there is for diversity, for to be create. We've got to make people feel comfortable, and people are actually comfortable in different ways. Now, I think through history, this is the single most exciting creativity space that I've come across, and it might look like a disused porter cabin just outside rugby, which <laughs> it, which it is. But this was the original post office innovation centre. And it was a short life building, was the polite way of putting it, prefab. And uh, they built the most wonderful innovation centre. Now, they subsequently, they, they lost the planning permission for it and they built a custom design two and a half million pound building, very, very impressive. Um, I don't know, some, some, some of you might have been there, it's an exciting building, it's paid its way and so on. But actually that original one, I mean, it had some of this bricolage about it. The fact it was an old condemned porter cabin, they made it a wonderful, warm, quite small space. This is a much more corporate uh, headquarters, sort of beautiful, well-equipped uh, equipment from Disney. It's, it's even got aroma generators in here, so you can set it for Highland Breeze or a tropical uh, beach uh, aroma, if you wish. Uh, but actually, I, I honestly preferred this one. And it's interesting, at Copenhagen Business School, where uh, Angela Dove has been in recently, um, 
I've just seen that they, they are closing. They, it's rather like this one. They were in a short life property. And do you think that was a good thing to have a short life property and move on to something else? Yeah, I think that was, uh, uh, I think they, th that was part of the, the principles that they built mm. it on, that they can sort of uh, improvise, continue, work out what works in the space and then move on to a new space and, and build on that, so yes. So when we came to build the Cass Business School, we were reluctant to have a space called an innovation centre. That this experience made me a bit sceptical about whether we really needed a dedicated space. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a dedicated space, and the post office has done a very good job. Uh, another thing that influenced us is that we'd uh, worked with Hearst in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they had taken an old loading bay and converted it into a wonderful uh, innovation space with the head, head Tom Vocic, who's been a visiting le lecturer here at uh, City. And they'd just taken this bay, they, they, they'd put almost every kind of technology in. They had the Disney Aroma stuff as well. Um, they had flashing lights, uh, psychedelic videos, all sorts of stuff. Kitchenette, very, very important, of course. Uh, they used the height, they had unusual objects around the walls. He had all his full set of thinking hats in there, if you notice, for the different colours. Uh, it was absolutely everything you could possibly want in a creativity environment. And it was the most amazing uh, situation, and it was loved by customers and the R&D people, but it was hated by the marketing department. And the, the, because the marketing department just wanted incremental change, and this place was about innovation. And it was very, very threatening to the established order. And in fact, when they were taken over, um, the, the, the company, one of the first acts of the new management was to tear this building down. It was a symbolic act by the new management. Fortunately, my colleague Nigel went out. We decided to send him out on an emergency mission, and uh, he came back with tea chests of the stuff that, was, that would otherwise have been thrown out. So we've, we've actually kept some of that. But it's a warning that if you build something called an innovation center, you actually make yourself vulnerable to people who want to change a new order. So I think these experiences uh, are maybe a bit cautious about dedicated innovation spaces. Moving on to virtual spaces, um, and just really picking on the learning area, because this is a very hot area at the moment. Uh, in academia, we, we have all our students use a virtual learning environment, so that's taken for granted. It allows interaction, discussion, communication. There's been the introduction in the last year of something called MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. Actually, our interest in the Cass Business School is in something called the opposite of that, which is called SPOCs, which are small private online courses. And finally, at, uh, one of the projects that was up on my list of the 10 years was a £2 million project funded by the Big Lottery Fund to develop informal learning spaces. So not going using the, the model of formal learning, but informal uh, learning. And uh, that We've passed over to, it was for training managers in the voluntary sector, and we've handed that over to NCVO, and that now has 39,000 registered users. So we, we did everything that was asked for us in that and created a successful informal learning spaces. The jury is fairly clear that you can develop online learning which is as good as face-to-face at a price and under certain circumstances. I'm afraid MOOCs, which is where all the publicity are at the moment, are not falling into this category. Uh, they, are, they seem very unlikely to be able to replicate the quality of uh, um, high quality face to face. But um, my view is, I should be controversial here and somebody may want to come back. I actually believe that with face to face, uh, with virtual, we can potentially create a better environment for creativity and meetings than a face-to-face. -face. Now this, this, I know I'm in a minority when I say this, but if you look at the tool that we use here for web conferencing, it's Adobe Connect. When I work with that, with a group of people here, I'm working with five students in a tutorial. Um, when you work with that, I feel very close to those five students in a quite different way than I do face to face. And I feel from an educational point of view that I can have just as good a relationship with those five simply because I have so many ways that I can communicate at once with them. 
Uh, so for example, down here I can do a pole. Now I can do a pole here, but it's, it's much easier. I can have all this set up. Uh, we have chat going on simultaneously, even with a small group of five people. I can be giving a PowerPoint up there, and of course we've got all audio and video connections as well. So I, this is my controversial argument. I go along with that. No, not only do I go along with the no significant difference, I would actually argue we can develop with modern technologies better collaboration and creativity environments than face-to-face. -face. I'm not saying all uh, web-based stuff is better. Most of it is worse. I'm simply arguing there are circumstances where we can be better. So I'm throwing that out as a controversial view and I'd be very happy to take any especially critical comments to that. Yes, please? Yeah, I love the idea. I think uh, we should put the Houses of Parliament online, leave them all in their constituencies so they're available to their constituents and uh, keep them protected from lobbyists and... That's an interesting... Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a good will. Make a note of that. That's an interesting one. There is a big problem if uh, uh, you need to ensure to engage all these people. If they're not st sitting uh, in front of the computer, yeah. if, they, if you need to move, if you need to stand around of, uh, the table, and then you need to carry some of these devices and personally carry the person which will be involved in that. I'm quite skeptical about that, and probably we need a little bit of a technology to do that. I do quite a lot of uh, video yeah. conferencing on... And, and so you're saying the problem is they have to sit in front of the, the webcam, yeah. which it, obviously in your environment, which is engineering, you might want to go and what, demonstrate pieces of equipment. To stand around the table, demonstrate, see okay. that. And if you need to carry the person with you yeah. on an iPad or something like yeah. that, then uh, it becomes very personal, and that's that's quite a difficult thing to do. Of course, you could have a, a head cam there. Still, you are carrying it, 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 it's It's still not the same. I mean, that circumstance isn't the same. Because, partly because the stuff you're dealing with is so 3D, isn't it? That, that's the real difficulty. This is essentially a 2D world, so it's not going to work so well where you've got authentic 3D, like engineering objects, pumps, I guess, in your compressor. Yeah, yeah. Different, things. different things. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we did was we found that in the online world, we've got to come up with new genre. And the genre that we came up with in our uh, big lottery project was the concept of a management soap opera. Now, the idea here was taken from the Archer's radio program. We unashamed the Archer's radio program. Does anyone know who funded the Archer's radio program originally, back in 1952? Yes, please. It was exactly the Ministry. I wish I had some prizes to hand out at this point, but it was the Ministry of Agriculture. They, were, they felt farmers were falling behind in their innovation and there was no good way of getting to them through, through newspapers or other routes, so they thought, well, we'll set up a soap opera and we'll weave in the update. And they still do that, although they, they're not funded anymore by the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, really? So it's still, there is still some governmental interference in the archers? Yeah. <laughs> So we, there are a lot of badger related. There are a lot of badger related. <laughs> so we we decided to develop a town in the Midlands of Britain called Milcaster. Uh, this town had got various characters and charities in it, and you don't you didn't want to go and work there because every single charity had some systemic management problem <laughs> in it. And we started with individual uh, charities, and then we had actually a combination of charities. There was a disastrous uh, rock concert organized jointly, which went all wrong. So the, f the fact of the matter is, when people are remote learners, it, it, we can't just take the, uh, the methods of face-to-face -face or tradition. We need new things. So um, we were very lucky in that we, got, um, we had a very good illustrator working on it. It was uh, uh, actually text-based with illustrations, but we got further funding from The Guardian and we were able to develop animation and we had actor doing a voiceover as well. So um, I'm still convinced that there's a huge potential for this and it doesn't rely on video, which is very expensive. Uh, it relies on people's actual imaginations and, and the beauty of radio. This is essentially a sort of radio put into web uh, format. Um, is that it's very scalable. It's one of the attractions. If you look at the Archer's website, it's a wonderful community 
of practice and they even have people writing their own uh, sort of extensions to the arches on that website. So were, you, were you asking people to think creatively about management issues? Yeah, they, they, it was like case study. In effect, like we had a, a two-stage case study. So week one, they get the first stage, this missing laptop. We then get responses in how to deal with that, and then we'd have a second episode, which compl which then went on with a sort of version of it. We'd pre-written it. I think if we had got further funding, we could have ex we could have actually had different streams, even of options for people to follow. Uh, so we hired a professional scriptwriter from the bill, uh, not to um, write it, but to teach the rest of us to write it. One of the things we found was. An awful lot of people in the business school were writers. They were novelists, playwrights, but they kept it secret. They didn't want anyone in the school to know this. So we had, they all came out the closet when we came to produce the Millcaster Tales soap opera. What was the last point? No, the last point was just explaining it. It was another episode. Uh, one was about the um, missing laptop, and the other was about low-level bullying. So they're quite, you can see we're not taking, this, on a MOOC learning environment, you're not going to get issues like low-level bullying because it's such a difficult issue to, set, you know, there's lots of sophisticated and subtle issues surrounding low-level bullying. Imaginative spaces, visual thinking, which do you think, Bill, if, going back to my three categories of rational, socio-technical and bricolage, which do you think Will Self is out of those three? Possibly, but I think I see him as very rational. rational. Very rational. This, to me, this is very rational. You know, just look, even look at those files, how neatly they're. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he will self, obviously, you know, he, a highly creative person, but needs mentally and indeed physically to organize himself. And actually, this is from his own website, <laughs> which also tells you something, that he has a, four, a 3D view of his office. So I've just taken one of the pictures there, but it, the rest is all consistent, though he does, his, his desk looks out over the uh, of a window. So clearly this is not for everybody. This isn't the way that some of us in this room are creative. This is very much kind of the rational instrumental uh, approach being applied. The thing that we've done is to uh, particularly emphasize for business students the use of sketchbooks. And this is also being done in the Michael uh, degree as well. Of course, there's a long history of sketchbooks outside business, but what we've been doing is working with business students for their reflections. Uh, we get them to, to use artist type sketchbooks. Uh, this would be in a 10 week course and at the end of the term we have an exhibition of their work. So what we're using here, the imaginative space, is, is that blank page of an artist's sketchbook. And some students find this very difficult, so we've evolved another version where we pre-print some pages so that they, they've got some scaffolding uh, to work from. But you can see here that the quality of work that, that is coming from business studies students, all the stuff in there is written about management topics. Yes, please? Is that, is that based on They are assessed. This is one of the assessment. So assess, reflection is a very important part of the module say 30% of the marks, and they are assessed on their sketchbooks. And we have an explicit set of criteria that they're marked to, uh, which excludes artistic merit. It, it has to, because we're not an art school. So some of the, the most, I mean, Angela has been uh, the person most involved in this. Uh, I mean, the highest marks, Angela, don't necessarily go to the students who are the best drawers, do they? No. Uh, absolutely, we make that very, very clear to students. We we have to do that. But yeah. invention, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to include uh, high level. Art. Now we've also got Hazel here from uh, London. Ma Hazel, what's your experience with business students in, in using these sorts of methods? I, I think we, we use um, uh, visual methods to show ideas, mm. and the students start to link themselves and their own experiences mm. to what the concepts are and they smile a lot, and talk to each other a right, lot, right. and it relaxes people. And um, the student, and I do it with undergraduates, um, my postgrads are here, but with the undergraduates, they start to share a lot, and their feedback has been that it gives them um, their own voice, and they enjoy okay. themselves. I'm just interested in the criteria factor, because I kind of feel what might 
constrain people? We, we've got a, a categorization of reflection to three types. We call it note-taking, basic reflection, and deep reflection. And the students are given a quite detailed analysis of what these three things are. They're also given examples of, of what they are, uh, of them. So it, it's, uh, I've also got Yolanta in here. You've also got experience of using these types of things. So I think it's fascinating that we're seeing that's, that's three Lon London universities here, all of whom are using these sorts of methods with their business students. Uh, interesting, I talk to uh, colleagues in art colleges and they say some of their students are reluctant to do anything in physical books anymore. They like using the, the, the screen in design. So, Andrew? Uh, what I'm interested in is you don't ask the students to make the sketchbook. Because I think no. one of the processes that would be interesting would be if you got them involved in the making of the sketchbook. <coughs> because I think I'm one of these people that making things brings people together. Mm. And that, that would be, I think, a very interesting process and a learning process too. And we, we, we were funded to do it with, people, with the general public to have a better understanding of geology. And what we did was we, we put in prompts within the sketchbook. Yeah. So that people could... Trace, Which is what we are doing trace now. Or, yeah. You know, uh, we also, got, yes. So the other point I wanted to make, which was very interesting, is that all of a sudden, the students bought that size. Oh, the so sort of A3, A3. I just, I just said Incredible. Yeah, yeah. that size. Yeah. And so the, you can imagine in the assessment office, they're all arriving and they're all sort of Well, uh, we've got uh, students off the Michael here. I noticed that in the, our Michael degree, several people there chose A3 size for the portfolio. We also have an exercise called the back of the envelope where the students have to sum themselves up. Literally, we literally give them an old CAS business school envelope for symbolic and other reasons. Obviously back of the napkin is the phrase they use in America, but back of the envelope works very well and we, each student does one that we can display all of them in an exhibition. Um, we've also, when we talk about imaginative space, we can use some existing imaginative spaces. These are physical, so it kind of overlaps. Um, but this was, we took an MBA group to the Whitechapel Gallery, and we were lucky enough to actually sit with Picasso's uh, paint, uh, tapestry of Guernica. There are four versions of this available. This one was on the Whitechapel. And do you notice the shape of the table that my 20 MBA students were sitting at? Yes, it was the, my favorite round table again. So um, uh, a number of us in this room, not just City University, have made use of artistic spaces, museums, art galleries and so on to help stimulate our business students imagination. So I thought we'd do a little exercise now and uh, call on you to say where you yourselves are your most imaginative and we can... Um... Andy, thanks. So we're looking here for the broad kind of categories of uh, where, where you feel yourself most imaginative. Anybody going to start off? Mark? In the bath. In the bath? Yeah. Walking. Walking, yeah. Working out. Working out. That's in a gym. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 travel. We'll generalise that to travel. Running. Running. So I could, uh, can I link that to the working out? Because I think it's in the same sort of physical exercise. Making something. Making something. Any? In conversation. Conversation. But I'm doing something very repetitive at work. So actually something boring. <laughs> so bore. I was going to say boring meeting. So, boring meeting, yeah, so we've got meeting, 
Uh, and my favourite one is airport departure lounge, because <laughs> it's so awful that I actually find that a stimulus to... The great outdoors. The great outdoors. Can I link that with walking? Is that fair? Because I think it's, it's in that... Uh, it's in the rural, yeah? Kind of more of a climate one, but where I feel I've got total kind of permission to get things wrong. It's more about permission and trust. So... To, uh, but that's less... Uh, no, but I think we'll, it's worth putting in. Reading. Reading. Sorry, I'm not scrolling, thanks. Yeah. Scroll. Read. When there is no time. Pressure, yeah, time pressure. Okay, well, it's a, a fascinating uh, We could go on. Uh, it's a fascinating list. That. And, of course, what is interesting in there is how personalised your answers were. Did that come over? Mm. You know, people come up quickly with an idea, and they're, they're, they're not all different, but um, they're very distinct. You know, that's, that's eight to ten. You've got to look a bit concerned. It's about people are doing something, and I, I put myself in that category. Like, if I'm running, I'm doing something. Yeah. But somehow un unleashes another thought. Right. So That's a good. No one's just sitting doing nothing. Well, no. Mark in the bath is. <laughs> I think. Doing something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go there. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, I've got. A, I've done a survey of my students on. Can I, can I say one, one Yeah, of course. Thing that's missing there is growing, as in gardening. Yeah. Where, where would gardening go? Because it's not exercise, is it? It's, it's not really... It's nurturing something. With making, creating. Making? Yeah, we'll put... I think we'll... Because gardening is... You know, it's one of... We're talking about the art in it. Yeah. Gardening is one of the most popular... It is. It is. Yeah. Okay, Raoul? Waking up after a good night's sleep. Yeah. Right, so that... So some early morning is that, it's actually the time of day. For so post sleep, <laughs> yeah, adversity. That's all. That sort of does. Does that overlap? That's time pressure, isn't it? But, but other kinds of adversity. Yeah, other kinds. Generically, some of these you qualify as a kind of these flow activities. Where yeah. You're kind of cognitively flow. Engaged. Are you flowing after? You <laughs> sounds like you are, Ralph. <laughs> okay, uh, one final one. Well, probably it's related to your mind. Yeah. Uh, is when I'm, sleep, when I'm sleeping, yeah? Yeah. The inconvenient thing is that I will forget because it's like at that time and also when I wake up. So, intersleep. Yeah. There is a word. I've forgotten the sign. There is a scientific word for this. When you're drifting in and out of. Yeah. Liminal, liminal states. Yeah. I'm gonna have to move on um, here. Uh, this for undergraduates. This is their favourite uh, spaces, and obviously this reflects to some extent their lifestyles. So for quite a few of them, they associate their, the desk they work at with... It's interesting, not a single adult in this room put their office, did they, what, barely put their office or, or desk. That's interesting. Nature, which covers the outdoors and so on. Personal activities, which is your bath, uh, gym, things like that. Uh, public spaces, which included travel for them. A lot of them were in uh, public libraries. Then different rooms of the house. Actually, for undergraduates, there is a whole section on bedrooms. Bec for understandable reasons, they are living in bed sits, many of them. So that for them, the bedroom is actually their everything. So it's, I don't think it's an accident uh, there and, and the home uh, generally. When we've done this for management consultants, there is an incredible emphasis on food and drink locations. Uh, so there are some big differences between management consultants and under, whereas they can't really afford, I don't think undergraduates can afford. No, no, neither here in the room nor there. That's not my idea. Yeah? Maybe just sat next to me. Okay. Um, no one said it online. 
internet. No, it's interesting, no isn't it? Online. It's very interesting. No? No? Very rarely comes up with that group, even though, of course, this is a generation which is living yeah, right, yeah. online. I mean, it could be, of course, they, that, you know, in the course they're somehow imagining in, imagination as sort of something different, but uh, it's, it's like the office doesn't come up and online doesn't come up. Uh, and so what we do is we get them to bring in a, a, a photograph which symbolizes the space they want. Most of them take a photograph uh, and they write text and then they gr these groupings have come from a group of students who I allocate to bring the work uh, together. I mean this was what, this is again a, a, an illustration of what a business studies, this is a first year business studies undergraduate and you can see they've done a very artful piece of work. This is actually coursework. Um, it's a, it's a very attractive uh, representation of it, including a little drawing and, uh, you know, uh, it actually looks, says, no, it follows, it's as if I paid you to say what you just said, because it says, no internet, no, you know, actually it's the absence of those things. So maybe this generation, which is so-called multitasking, realises that the creative focus can't come when you're doing six other things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Put it all to one side, which could account for your gardening, open air, walking, and. I think generally um, on the internet, things are created to be specific. Yeah. They're, 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 you're, not, you're not there to look for ideas and, and necessarily. Yeah. You know, or indeed, not look for it, because some of these uh, creative things come up when you're not looking, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the absence of something which is taking place in much of. You're involved in a, in, in, in a task, task mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. But that's probably taking it from the sort of initial idea. You've had the the great brainwave, and then you're kind of evaluating it and improving it and checking it out. So maybe you're surfing something and you find some idea used in different fields. So serendipity can can take place on the web. Clearly, clearly can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things that is on that list I showed you for the um, uh, CAS Learning Lab is that we've invented a new form of academic conference. And the bad news is this essentially involves going to a Greek island. This is the heart of it, right? So just put that just... Um, but this is the... Uh, we, we've set up with Copenhagen Business School uh, association called the Learning in Higher Education. We've run now since 2008 a large number of these events. We have the normal academic peer review, but the aim is to get a book which three months after the event is in the bookshops. So there are no PowerPoint, no projectors and no presentations at this conference. It's a, a fantastic release from the... T you, you travel 5,000 miles, you give a 10 minute presentation, four people show up and nobody takes any interest. This is the complete opposite. You spend four days, two, first two days are spent improving your chapter and the second two days are spent improving the book as a whole. So it's a collective exercise, there's usually about 20 people um, and based on the idea of giving positive feedback to people, appreciative inquiry. We do, I'm afraid, have compulsory social activities <laughs> at this, which I won't enter into, but let's say they take full advantage of the uh, Greek island location. That's the most I will say about it. And um, we've, we've expanded out into Iceland because we had a very inviting offer to go to Iceland in October. Um, and then we also run them in South Africa, Australia, and next week in the USA. So uh, we're not afraid to start up new initiatives to look for new forms of space. And uh, as you can see here, it was very multicultural. People from all over the world uh, attracted to the Greek island. And this is actually in the break between the sort of conversations where people are rewriting their papers. So they rewrite their paper three or four times during the event there. Yeah. Um, uh, just, um trying to get my thoughts straight here. Yeah. Uh, right at the start, I thought you said it wasn't the space that uh, generated the creativity, no. it's the climate. No. So there's something special about being in a Greek island? Not, not really. Uh, the Greek island is a marketing issue. Right. The thing is, we've created a process 
which encourages people who want to partake in that kind of, of it attracts a particular type of person who is committed to you know open face-to-face -face critique not not uh, anonymous review but non-anonymous review yeah. and and we've created we've got a reputation and people come many people come repeat business as it were so I would say it's very much the climate would you agree Andy it's the climate and process yeah. and do you think issues it, it attracts a special kind of yes person? it definitely attracts people who want more than a 10-minute presentation and sort of ritualistic powerpoints Right, and, and they want to get a publication. By the, by yeah, yeah. Criticism or uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we've also uh, had a very good relationship with Neil Malarkey, who's uh, from the Comedy Store, and uh, we, we ran a one year project with senior executives as to how business improv could be used. As this is obviously the ultimate bricolage, is improv. Uh, so, to sum up, um, what we've been doing in the last six months is exploring how we can take some ideas from sociology here, especially the work of Henri Lefebvre. Lefebvre was a sociologist influenced by looking at new towns in France in the 50s and his experiences as a professor at the University of Nanterre, which was where a lot of the 68 riots took place, uh, built in 1964 in an outskirts of Paris. He was highly critical of the rational instrumental method. And uh, I don't know if we've got any French speakers here, but I could do with a help from a French speaker. Have we got anybody who's a native French speaker? Non so are you able to say these three wonderful French words yeah. for us? So, so we say the first one? Conçu. Conçu, which is the conceived space. The second one? Perçu. Perçu, I can't do it, which is perceived. And the third one? Viku, which is the live space. And what he argues is, what architects and designers do is the first one. They conceive a space. They might get a physical space made, but they only conceive a space. The people who use it do the persu, which is the generated and put into use by everyday activity. And the most important one for Lefebvre was the third one, which is the veku, which is the lived space. And this is the bricolage element where ordinary people transform the actual use over time. So they may discard the conceived space of the architect and designer and make it into something else. Uh, this comes from his 99, uh, 1991 book, The Production Space, and I believe this is very, very significant. Uh, ironically, I've, ha I've had this book in my bookshelf for two years and never opened it. And it was only in a moment of desperation I went back as I was trying to uh, theorize this that, that I brought these three together. So this is my big new message from 2013. We need to think about what are architects and designers really creating space or are they only, in Lefebvre's term, conceiving it and it's actually users at the end of the day. Uh, Lefebvre was a, was a Marxist and saw, uh, was very hostile actually to uh, totalitarian, whether under capitalist or a, 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 a sort of Stalinist system. And we've listened to our students. Uh, I'm, uh, Neil's getting anxious here, but I'm drawing to a, a close now. We listened to our students. We had an exercise for our new building where Susie Harith, who's an artist, uh, Angela hired her to get ideas from the students about what they wanted from the university, and she sketched them there and then. And this is more in this third type of taking the actual users who want to want a better space for themselves as students and uh, this was a design which Angela did in 2004 for our undergraduate area which was uh, politely I could say ignored in 2004 we've just refurbished this space and it's almost identical to what the students came up with uh, nine years ago as, as what they wanted. They wanted the balcony brought into use, which has been done. They wanted it to feel very comfortable and be reconfigurable for them. It's been done. This was actually really, I mean, I sketched it out, yeah. but the students that came up with this I know. Ideas. The students themselves came up. So this is uh, Vécu, <laughs> the lived, what they want to see happening. And uh, so finally, because uh, I, I've not got time to do everything, um, I've been disappointed that neither physical or virtual spaces have, have, 
have led to the changes that I'd hoped for 20 years ago. And that's why I've become skeptical about whether actually space does lead directly to uh, creativity. I'm amazed at how important physical things remain, even in a highly virtual uh, world. I do think when we come and look at expensive computer and buildings, huge amounts of politics are involved. And those of us who are concerned with effective use of physical and virtual space need to be contesting some of the assumptions around that. And finally, those who interested in leadership issues, leadership, I think, has to work across all three of those rational, socio-technical and bricolage dimensions. So I'm sorry I've had to rush a bit at the end there, Neil, but... Uh, Thank you.